Hey guys, today's video is going to cover chapter eight. Um, there's probably going to be a second video, um, which will be shorter. This one will be the longer of the two. Uh, let's go ahead and start your note taking with a title, chapter eight. I'm actually going to kind of give it my own title. I think in the book it's just this latter part, but uh, let's entitle chapter eight, electron configurations orbital diagrams and periodic properties of the elements. Periodic properties of the elements is going to be the second part of this video, so that we won't be covering this part today. Um, my goal today is to get through electron configurations and orbital diagrams, but go ahead and entitle this in your notes so you can kind of see where we're going to be going with this chapter. All right, let me go ahead and erase this. So today's goal is really to get into and cover electron configurations and orbital diagrams, how to write them, how to understand them. Um, and and I, my goal is to not just teach it robotically. I actually want you to kind of understand how it relates to quantum theory uh, the, or the quantum mechanical model, everything that we learned from Chapter 7. So actually, let's pick up there. Um, let me go ahead and entitle this next this, this part of your notes, the quantum mechanical model of the atom. As it, and, and really what we want to kind of get into here is um, asking the questions, what question, what um, possible orbitals can exist in an atom? So how, um, what, what kind of orbitals can, can um, electrons even live in in an atom according to quantum mechanical model? Um, all right, so you even see this term possible. This is getting us, this is connected to this idea of the possible values of the quantum numbers. So you need to have watched the chapter seven video, the last chapter seven video to understand what I'm talking about here. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and um, kind of draw the, the top half of an atom again. Remember when we did the Bohr model, I had us do the top cross section of an atom. So essentially, we are replacing the Bohr model, which was our precursor model, with our current model, quantum mechanics. But it's going to kind of start out the same way. So let's draw a nucleus. Let's remember that the nucleus is always positive because that's where the protons live. Let's also remember that as electrons move farther and farther away from a nucleus, you are increasing in energy. Um, the lowest energy areas will be closest to the nucleus because that's electrons want to be close to the nucleus. They're negative, it's positive. Um, and as you move farther away from the nucleus, you're increasing in energy. So this is kind of how we are going to start our drawing here. All right, so let's talk about, let's kind of diagram the possible orbitals that, that can exist in an atom. So as you remember, when you're describing an orbital, um, the, there's the three quantum numbers. So I think in the, in the previous video, I used what was called 3PY um, to explain this. So the first number in your orbital name is your n value. The second is related to your l value. And the little subscript there is related to your ml value or your orientation. So that's kind of how we are naming our orbitals. All right. So... The closest um, level to the nucleus, um, you'll remember that the first n value that you can have is 1. Let me go ahead and draw that here. Remember, n, the possible values for n are 1, 2, 3, etc. n cannot be a 0, and it has to be a whole number integer. So your first n value is 1. That's the first possible value that you can have for n. And those are your smallest, that's going to be your smallest orbital um, closest to the nucleus. All right, what scientists call this is they call this principal energy level one. Let me move this arrow over a little bit so I have a little bit more space. Okay, so um, the, this is like the level closest to the nucleus. And so, in all, essentially, when the scientist says principal energy level one, all that they're saying is that the n value has to equal one for all the orbitals. That's all that it really, really means. Okay, so we have a one. Now, remember from our previous discussion, when n equals one, what are the possible values of L? 
L is equal to all numbers from 0 to n minus 1. So not taking too long on this, when you have an n equals 1, the only L value you can have is 0. And a 0 means you have an s orbital. So in this level closest to the nucleus, you cannot have any p orbitals. You can only have s orbitals. And further, remember that when L is equal to 0, the only ml value is 0. So there's only one orientation or one orbital for that s value or for that s orbital. So when you are talking about this level closest to the nucleus, the zones that you can have, the electrons can live in, the only, the only orbital is a 1s orbital. That's it. There's no other orbitals in this level. However, when you start moving away from the nucleus into what we call principal energy level 2, which is all the orbitals that have an n value equal to 2, it becomes a little bit more interesting. Okay, so first of all, all the orbitals in this level have to have an n value equal of 2. Now let's think about what the L values are. When n is equal to 2, L can be 0 and 1. So that means you can have s and p orbitals. So we can have s orbitals, and we can also have p orbitals. But the key thing here is that, um, and we would call them 2p orbitals because they're in the second level. Um, away from the nucleus, they have an n value of 2, so they're larger and higher in energy than anything down here, but we now have p orbitals. But the key here is that you have to kind of remember, when we talk about p orbitals, we're actually talking about a set of three of them, the 2px, the 2py, and the 2pz. So it's not just one orbital. You actually get three orbitals. So in this level, there's actually three orbitals. There's the 2s, or sorry, four. There's the 2s, and then you get all three of the p orbitals. So the terminology here is that when we write this here, we're talking about the 2p, it's, the terminology would be the 2p sublevel. That's the terminology that you would use, the sublevel, the 2p sublevel, knowing that it contains three orbitals in that sublevel. Um, okay, so moving on to farther and farther away from the nucleus, principal energy level three. What kind of orbitals can we have in this level? Well, they will all have n values equal to 3. Remember, when n equals 3, L can be 0, 1, and 2. So you can have s, p, and d shapes. Once again, with s, you're only going to get a single orbital. It doesn't have multiple orientations. With p, you're going to have those three orbitals in the three different orientations. So you're going to have the 3px, the 3py, and the 3pz. You have all three of those orbitals. So in the black, I'm writing the three, I'm, I'm naming it as the sublevel, the called the 3p sublevel. We have to just remember that it comes as a set of three, like a Huey, Dewey, and Louie, three orbitals, three different places where electrons can live in that sublevel. And we will also have d orbitals in this sublevel, 3d orbitals. Now, with the three d's, remember, these come as a set of five different different orbitals oriented in five different directions. Now, unlike the p's where I try to write the x, y, and z, at least right now, um, I'm not even going to attempt to write the um, orientation um, the orientation descriptions because they're kind of complex. Just understand that there's going to be five of them, five different orbitals. Put some commas in here for the three d's. It's not just one of them. It comes with a set of five. Oops. All right, and then moving up one more level, and then we'll kind of let this topic go. In level four, you're going to have um, all, the, all the orbitals will have an n value equal to four, but you will have L values, possible L values of zero, one, two, and three, which corresponds to S, P, D, and F orbitals. So you will once again have a single S orbital. You see a pattern starts to emerge. You'll have three of the, of the four p orbitals in the three different orientations. You will actually have five 4d orbitals in the five different orientations. And now you will also have what are called f orbitals. And remember, with f orbitals, when l is equal to 3, the ml values, you can count seven different orientations, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, plus 1, plus 2, plus 3. That's seven, I'm writing the words, seven of them. You're going to get seven different 4f orbitals. So 
Understand that when we're talking about the possible orbitals that can exist in an atom, in other words, we can't have anything called a 1p. That does not exist. You don't get p orbitals in the n equals 1 level. You cannot get anything called a 2d. It does not exist because in the 2 level, you don't have d orbitals. Okay? So these are the possible orbitals that electrons can live in in an atom. Um, it's all determined by the quantum numbers. This is the part that I'm trying to make sure you understand. It comes from the possible values of the quantum numbers, which were, which came from Schrodinger's equation. So it really is all connected to everything that we learned in chapter seven. Okay, so when you think about orbitals, this is kind of what you should think about now. It gets a little bit more complicated. Um, well, actually, you know what? I will save that for, for in just a minute, but let me just have you add one thing to this here. Um, I'm going to explain it in just a little bit, but just add this to your notes here. This is the, um, the, the energy, um, the energy, um, diagram. Okay. Because if we're, we're ordering or we're showing these in order of their energy. Notice the energy is going up from the nucleus um, for hydrogen. Okay, hydrogen is a unique atom because it is, is the only atom that only has one electron. So this is how it looks for hydrogen. Um, hydrogen is simple. With only that one electron, the math is very simple for Schrodinger to do these, to do these um, calculations. So we'll come back to that in just a minute, but just make a little note. This is how it looks for hydrogen. And specifically, what I want you to notice is that the both the 2s and the 2p for hydrogen are equal in energy. So see how we have drew them in the exact same plane? Same with the, all the threes. They're all equal in energy um, for hydrogen. We will come back to that in just a little bit. But just make that little note that this is what is the situation for hydrogen. OK, let me get some room on my board. So key points there, as I'm erasing, we learned what it is, what a principal energy level is. It's just all the same end value. We learned what a sublevel is, and a sublevel can contain multiple orbitals if they're in different orientations. Um, and we made a list of all the possible orbitals. Now, let's start talking about electron configurations. What is an electron configuration? Or let me just use it in the plural. All right, electron configurations show the distribution of electrons into the various orbitals of an atom. And let me give one little thing here. In its ground state. In its ground state. And when you hear the word ground, maybe you're thinking about like electricity, like it needs to be grounded. And that's the right concept here. The ground state is the unexcited, unexcited atom. The one that is, let me take away that comment here. The one that is left alone, okay? It's not, um, not um, exposed to um, electricity or, you know, a flame, okay? We're not talking about atoms that are, we're not talking about the neon sign situation where you're exciting the atoms into um, higher energy levels than they're normally. Like the Bohr model, remember we excite the atom and then it falls down and emits um, a photon? We're not talking about that. We're talking about atoms that are just being left alone, um, in their kind of unexcited state. That's what we call the ground state. This is the default. So it's it's not, you don't need to overthink the ground state. It's just we're not we're not jumping the electrons into um, high levels is really what that means. Okay. All right, so electron configurations show the distribution of electrons into the various orbitals of an atom. Now Let's go ahead and just start writing electron configurations, and we'll teach some things as we move along. What we want to do is write the electron configuration for hydrogen. We'll start with hydrogen. Now, what you are 
the very first thing you want to do when you write an electron configuration is you need to know how many electrons actually live in this atom. How many do we even place? How many do we have to place into orbitals? So what you want to do is go to your periodic table and remember that that number right there is your atomic number. And the atomic number is really the number of protons. Okay, that is always the number of protons. However, remember, if your atom is neutral, which for now we're just going to assume all these atoms are neutral atoms. If your atom is neutral, it's also the number of electrons. Because the number of electrons and protons would be the same if your atom is neutral. So you're going to look at that number, and even though it's technically the number of protons, assume it's also the number of electrons if your atom is neutral. Okay? So we have one electron to place in a hydrogen atom. Now, um, we're going to be learning some principles here, and if I put them on the board, you're going to have to know them for the test, and you're going to have to know what they mean. So the first principle that we're going to talk about here is the off-ball principle. These are key principles of um, quantum mechanics. So what is the off-ball principle? The off-ball principle, essentially, I believe it means fill up in German, but let me put it in kind of more regular terms. This essentially means electrons will occupy or live in the lowest energy orbitals possible. And remember, the lowest energy orbitals are the ones that are closest to the nucleus. This is very much common sense. Electrons are negative. They want to be near that positive nucleus. So I erased it, but remember, when we had all of our possible orbitals, what was the orbital that was closest to the nucleus? It was the 1s orbital. It was the 1s orbital. So when we're writing the electron configuration for, let me go ahead and show you what this looks like, for hydrogen, what you want to do is you want to list the orbital sublevel. This is going to be the orbital sublevel. And as a superscript, you're going to list how many electrons live in that sublevel. So there is one electron, because there's only one electron in the hydrogen, in the 1s orbital, and voila, you have your electron configuration. For hydrogen, it is 1s1. All right, so off-ball principle is telling us that it doesn't live in the 3d or something like that at least in the ground state, it would live in the 1s orbital. That's all that the off principle is telling us. All right, so that is an electron configuration. And we'll do, we'll do many more, obviously. This is a very simple one. Let's go ahead and draw the orbital diagram for hydrogen. The orbital diagram is telling you similar information, but it's telling it to you in a different way. Okay, in an orbital diagram, Essentially, each orbital is represented by a box. So a box is equal to one orbital. Okay, that's what we do with orbital diagrams. We draw a box, and each of them will represent one orbital. So remember, in the 1s sublevel, there's just a single orbital. So I just want to draw one box. I need to label it. It's extremely important that we label our boxes. It can't just be a box. And... Um, so that's the orbital, and then the electrons are represented by arrows. Let me get some space here. So the, a box is equal to one orbital, and an arrow, which we're going to learn is either going to be written as an um, arrow that goes up or an arrow that goes down, okay? Each, each arrow is one electron. So an, one arrow equals one electron. Now, I'm going to go ahead and draw my arrow up for the one electron that live, that is in this um, orbital. But now let me go ahead and talk about what those two things mean, the, the up arrow and the down arrow. Remember that I told you there was a fourth quantum number. And I said it would be coming later, and it described not the orbitals, but the electrons. Well, the fourth quantum number is called the spin quantum number. That's his name, and he's abbreviated little m, little s. So spin quantum number. 
like all quantum numbers, we have what is the significance of it and what is what are the possible values. Let's start with the possible values. The possible values for the spin quantum number according to Schrodinger's equations are plus one half and minus one half. With the spin quantum number, there's only two possible values, plus one half and minus one half. And what is the significance? The, the spin quantum number tells you um, whether the electron spins up or spins down. Now, it really has to do with how the electron responds to a ma uh, magnetic field. However, it's fine if you just kind of think about it like, um, you know how the Earth spins on its axis? So picture an electron being a particle, and it would have an axis. Picture spinning up being like a clockwise spin, and spinning down being like a counterclockwise spin. Okay, so the electrons can spin. Um, just, it's oversimplifying it, but it's fine. Um, if the electron spins up, that is what is meant with a ms value equal to plus one half. That's what we mean when it spins up. It has the plus one half ms value. Whereas if it spins down, the ms value is equal to negative one half. Now, if you only have one electron in your orbital diagram, like hydrogen does, you just always draw it as if it's spinning up. So you're representing the one, the, um, the electron that has this quantum number, the plus one half. In reality, it probably spends half of its time doing one half of the, of the other, but by convention, you just always write it spinning up. Now we're gonna talk more about this quantum number in just a minute when we move on to some other um, elements. So let's go ahead and move on to some other elements. Let's do the electron configuration and orbital diagram for helium. So helium has a atomic number of two, meaning it has two protons, but it also has two electrons. So where do they live? The off-ball principle still applies. They're going to live as close to the nucleus as possible. However, so they're going to live in the 1s orbital. However, there's a new principle that we can introduce now here called the Pauli exclusion principle. This is a very important quantum mechanical principle. Pauli exclusion principle. The Pauli exclusion principle states this. No two electrons in an atom can have the same four quantum numbers. Okay, remember, there are four quantum numbers, N, L, ML, and MS. That's what we're talking about. No two electrons in an atom can have the same four of them. So this actually makes a lot of sense if you just dig in and kind of think with, it for, with me for a minute. Let's return to the electron configuration in just a second. Let's come over to the orbital diagram. We're not done with this, but I want to I do it from this point of view first. Once again, the two electrons in helium, they need, want to live as close to the nucleus as possible. So go ahead and draw your 1s orbital box. Okay, now, um, according to the Pauli exclusion principle, those two electrons will occupy this orbital in this way. One of them will spin up and one of them will spin down. Let's think about why. Why is it that they both can't spin up? Or maybe both can't spin down? Why does one have to go up and one have to go down? Well, just think about it for a minute here. These two electrons, because each arrow represents an electron, these two electrons have the same, think about it with me for a minute, they have the same n value, one. They have the same l value, which is zero, because remember, an s orbital is l equals zero. They have the same ML, ml value, because remember, ml is a zero if l is zero. So therefore, they must have different ms values according to the Pauli exclusion principles. 
principle. One of their quantum numbers has to be different. That is the reason why one of them has to spin up and one of them has to spin down. Okay, so um, that's how helium's um, orbital diagram is going to look. That's how his two electrons are going to, or where his two electrons are going to live. In the 1s orbital, one spinning up, one spinning down. Now, the electron configuration would just be the orbital sublevel and how many are living in that sublevel, two. There's, so helium is just 1s2. Let's go ahead and talk about several more here because there's a bit more to say. Um, let's keep that up here for now. Let's go on to lithium. We're obviously not going to do all the, the elements, but at the very beginning, um, with the smaller elements, you can teach all these principles very simply. So that's why we're kind of do, walking through this. And by the way, I know that some of you, probably several of you, can already do electron configurations. Maybe you already learned in high school and you just maybe read your periodic table. What I'm trying to make sure you don't miss is the connection of it all, the, how all of this stuff really is just quantum mechanical theory being played out. I'm not trying to teach, I, I want you to kind of get to a, a higher level of understanding of chemistry rather than just kind of rote learning. Um, all right, anyhow, lithium. How many electrons are we talking about? Three. Lithium's quantum uh, atomic number is three. We have three electrons we need to place in orbitals. The question is where do they live? What orbitals do they live in? Okay, now, as you might imagine, Aqua principle says they're going to live as far as close to the nucleus as possible. Let's start with our orbital diagram this time. Okay, so they want to live as close to the nucleus as possible. So let's go ahead and draw our 1s orbital. It's going to be, it's going to end up getting filled up with electrons because you're not going to get to start entering those other orbitals until he's filled up. That's the purpose of the aqua principle. Um, all right, now. Three electrons. The question you might ask is, will they all try to occupy this orbital? And hopefully you can see, if you think about it with me just a little bit, is that that is not going to be possible because of the Pauli exclusion principle. If all three lived in that orbital that was close to the nucleus where you think they would want to live, they will violate that principle because um, that third one is going to have to either spin up or spin down. So it's going to end up having to have the same four quantum numbers as one of the other two. And um, that's not possible according to the Pauli exclusion principle. And by the way, that's the, per the, the, uh, the word exclusion. That third electron is excluded from this orbital. So what I've just kind of tried to connect for you is this. The Pauli exclusion principle is the reason why there are two electrons max per orbital. You can never have more than two electrons in an orbital. A lot of people know that, but they don't know why. This is the reason why. A third one would violate the Pauli exclusion principle because it would end up having the same four quantum numbers as one of the other two. Therefore, that third one is going to have to enter a new orbital. So we're only going to get to have two of them in the 1s orbital. So what orbital will the next one enter? Now, let me go ahead and erase a little bit here. A little bit ago, we drew this diagram that looked like this. And I had energy right here. Let me just recreate this for you here. And actually, let me add a couple, let me add the five level. The, all the others will just follow the same pattern of S, P, D, and F. Um, technically, you can just keep going with your n values all the way to infinity. But um, anyhow, I'll just stop with this one here. So these are all the possible orbitals. So that third electron, which one is it going to live in? It's obviously, this one is full. So it's going to live somewhere in this level here. Okay, because it's going to be, have to occupy the next highest level of orbitals in terms of energy. Because remember, it wants to be as close to the nucleus as possible, but it is excluded from this one. Now, I had you make a little note that said, this ordering is true for hydrogen. If this was a hydrogen atom, which it's not, um, then 
the electron, the next one could have really gone to either because these are the same energy level. However, for what we call multi-electron atoms, multi-electron atoms are all atoms besides hydrogen. This is not the order of the orbitals in terms of their energy. Let me go ahead and show you the, the relevant slide here. Chapter 8, it's on page 343. This is a slide I always show in class here. Um, you'll see the title of the slide is General Energy Ordering of orbitals for multi-electron atoms. See, multi-electron atoms is basically all atoms besides hydrogen. This is telling you the order of their energy, which is important because this tells you the order that they get filled up. Once again, you can see 1s is still the lowest. Okay, but however, you'll notice that the, the 2s, the 2s and the 2p sublevel are separated. They're not on the same energy level as they are with hydrogen. In fact, this tells you that the 2s orbital is actually lower in energy, because that's what the red line means, than the 2p orbitals. Remember, there's three of them in that sublevel. Um, and that's significant because that tells you that that third electron will end up in this one, the 2s, not in the 2ps. Now, when you look at the slide, it might seem like very difficult. Like, how are you supposed to remember um, all of this pattern because it's not as easy as it seems. So the S is lower than the P's, but then you get your 3S, then your 3P's are higher, but then you'll notice that the um, the 4S is lower than the 3D. So um, in terms of trying to get, like, you know, memorize it or whatever, that's not really the, the best approach. Um, so really, let me show you, well, there's going to be two ways I can show you how to do this. The first is to, uh, is to note something which is called the diagonal rule. So the diagonal rule, let me put this in green. Because it's important for you to know the order of the orbitals, that the, their energy order, so you know which order that they fill up. For lithium, it's going to be pretty easy. It's obviously going to be the 2s. I just showed you that the 2s is the lower one. But when we start getting lower on our periodic table to do something like... Um, um, manganese or something. You need to know what order they fill up. The diagonal rule, okay, will tell you the order that the orbitals fill up. So what you want to do is you want to just draw this grid, okay? It's basically what we started this lecture out with. So in the one level, it's just S's. In the two level, it's S and P's. You can draw it just like this. In the three level, it's you get S, P's, and D's. In the four level, you get all four letters. And then you can keep drawing all four letters. There's no extra letters added after after four. You could you could technically draw this all the way up to, you know, seven or eight or whatever, just as many as you want. But I'll just draw up to five. So when you draw this thing here, the diagonal rule is going to have you require, or is going to have you draw like a diagonal grid on this little diagram. So how I do it is like this. Um, I start with like a little dot here on the on the bottom right of the 1s, and I just draw a diagonal line through the 1s orbital. Okay, and I draw an arrow. Okay, the arrow is basically saying like follow this arrow. So we're going to fill up the 1s orbital first. And then draw the dot right here, and you're going to fill up the 2s. And the more you get used to drawing this, it becomes pretty easy. Then your dot will be here, and you're going to, um, you're going to fill up the 2s. Then you kind of wrap it around and start filling up these ones. So the 2p, the 3s gets filled up next. Notice my lines end up being diagonal how I'm drawing it. Now the, um, you'll go here, diagonal line, here diagonal line. This is why it's called the diagonal rule. You can see that I'm just kind of following diagonals. All right, so you draw like this diagonal grid, okay? Um, and this is going to tell you if you just follow the arrows, you'll know the order that your orbitals fill up. It's not like a human invention. It's like a, uh, one of these amazing mathematical patterns of science that ends up being true. If you look at this chart, 
And if you're curious and you just don't want to take my word for it, you'll see that as you move up in the energy ordering, you know, I'm just kind of following these all the way up, you will follow the exact same um, uh, orbitals as the diagonal rules. So the diagonal rule is kind of like a nice little replacement for trying to memorize this order. Okay. I, I don't know. I think everybody's got a method, which is not just memorization. So there is another way, which will come later when we talk about how to read the periodic table. Anyhow, coming back to where are we at? Lithium, the third electron. Okay. It's excluded from here. Where's it going to live? Well, 1s is full. So now the next one will be the 2s. Okay. The 2s is the next one that we're going to fill up. So the 2s orbital is a single box. If you only have one electron, we always make it spin up, and that's lithium's orbital diagram. His electron configuration is there for 1s2, 2s1. Okay, um, let's do several more, okay? And we can start going faster as we kind of lay all these principles out. With the diagonal rule, we're now in a position to go, to go fairly fast with these. Let's go ahead and do carbon. Carbon's going to allow me to teach you the third principle. So we've got the off-ball principle, the poly exclusion principle, and we're going back to learn what's called Hun's rule. So let's do carbon. Carbon has six electrons that we have to place into orbitals. We're trying to figure out where they live. Okay, now, this time, um, let's start with the electron configuration, okay? Let's start with the electron configuration. So six orbitals, sorry, six electrons. Let's use the diagonal rule. I'll show you kind of how this works. So this orbital is going to get filled up first, or I should say this sublevel, because this is representing the whole 1s sublevel, which is just one orbital. How many electrons can it hold? We know that s orbitals, when they're full, can hold two, um, or s sublevels can hold two electrons. So this is now full. Um, we still have four more electrons to place. So this one's full. And now kind of take your, it's kind of like follow the yellow brick road. Now just wrap around to the next level. Um, now we're going to fill up the 2s sublevel. So then the 2s sublevel, he can also hold two maximum because he's just a single orbital. Um, and so the next two will live in this orbital. Now, which next sublevel will we enter? The 2p, he comes next in terms of energy. The 2p sublevel will hold the last two, okay? So when you look at an electron configuration, understand that these numbers will all have to add up to the total number of electrons. That's one way to know that you're doing it right. So if you have six electrons, make sure these all add up to six. So you're going to have two electrons in that 2p Sublevel. Don't forget, that's talking about the entire sublevel. You have to kind of remember that there are actually three orbitals in that sublevel. So certainly they can hold two electrons. Now, to the orbital diagram. Let's go ahead and just turn this into an orbital diagram. So a box to represent the 1s orbital. Spin up, spin down. Another box for the 2s. Spin up, spin down. Now, with orbital diagrams, remember, each orbital is a box. So in our 2p sublevel, remember, there were three orbitals. One was the 2px, the 2py, and the 2bz. So what you're going to do, anytime you have p, like p sublevels, you actually draw a set of three boxes. Now, you can just put the label right underneath here. Now, I don't really need you to label x, y, z. Just understand that they are three different orientations. It's three separate orbitals. Remember, one of them is like this. One of them's like this, and one of them's coming out at you. There are three separate orbitals. Now, this orbital sublevel contains two electrons, the, the last two that carbon had. Um, how do we represent them? Well, think about it. You could maybe have like this. Okay, that might be one choice. Or maybe you've got those two arrows in different boxes. Let me go ahead and, and uh, tell you which one it is, and we know it from what's called Hun's rule. Hun's rule states that within an orbital sublevel, so that's talking about like 
within like this two p sub level, like the whole thing, electrons fill up singly before doubling up. That's what's called Hund's rule. So what that means is that we don't put a spin up, spin down in the same orbital. In fact, the, the two electrons will, will end up being um, in two separate orbitals. And this does also make sense because electrons are negative. They don't really want to be near each other. Um, so within the same energy level, they will spread out. Now, they will fill up this one before jumping to this because this causes a new jump in higher energy levels. So they'll be like, okay, fine, I'll partner with somebody here rather than enter a new one. But within a, a, a sublevel, they will spread out. That's called Hun's rule. Um, but once again, that only applies within a sublevel, okay? That doesn't, they're not gonna spread out across sublevels. That's why it will look like this for carbon. Um, all right, let's do, let's start jumping a little ahead. Let's do something like chlorine. Because once you get the hang of it, it gets, you know, it kind of gets repetitive and a lot easier. Let's go ahead and do um, the electron configuration for chlorine. So go ahead and go to your periodic table. Tell me how many electrons are we trying to place into orbitals? And you will see that chlorine has 17 electrons. And maybe go ahead and try to beat me to write the electron configuration. I won't talk, I'll just kind of do it on the board. And even an orbital diagram, let's have a stupo. Actually, you know what, I'm gonna, change my mind. I do want to talk a little bit because this is now some new things to say. We've got 17 electrons, okay? We're filling them up according to the off-ball principle in the correct order of the orbitals in terms of their energy. The 1s gets filled, okay, he can hold two. We got to make it all the way to 17. The 2s gets filled. Now, when you start talking about the 2p, remember, it's the whole sublevel of the 2p. It contains three orbitals. Orbitals can hold two electrons max. So the P sublevel is not full until it has six. In other words, it can contain six. If it helps you, you could write, um, you could write that here, as long as you remember that these are the max numbers. So S is contained two, can, can maximum contain two. P's can maximum contain six. D's can maximum contain 10, because D's are a set of five. So five times, Five orbitals with two electrons each is 10. And Fs can contain a maximum of 14 because there's seven of them. Um, seven orbitals, two electrons each contain, can contain maximum of 14. So what I'm writing here, some people like to do this here, is the maximum number of electrons um, it can contain. So that 2p is going to contain 6 because we've got 17 to place in orbitals. We have, we have them. So we've now placed 10 electrons. Let's keep going. After the 2p, we will fill up the 3s. He will be full. Okay, now we've placed 12. Five more to go. After the 3s is full, follow the yellow brick road. You're going to wrap this way and you're going to start filling up the 3p. Now, the 3p will not, this is maximum number. He can maximum contain 6 but we only have five more. So those last five will live in the 3P. In other words, that 3P is not gonna be full. We've run out. We only have 17 electrons. So if you count here, you'll see they add up to 17. This is the electron configuration of chlorine, okay? Orbital diagram, let me just draw it down here. You can start getting kind of fast at it. We're just drawing horizontally, turning this into a box, a, you know, orbital diagram boxes. Whenever you have the p orbitals, you always draw all three. Um, no matter what, you always draw all three. Okay, now it's just about spin up, spin down. Now, when we get to the 2p, even by habit, I always show them filling up singly before I double them up. 
I mean, they're all going to be full in this case, but that's just how I always do it. Now the 3s, spin up, spin down. Now moving on to this one. We've got five electrons. Hun's rule says fill them up singly before doubling them up. Okay, and that is the orbital diagram for chlorine. Now, what you would say about this is that chlorine has one unpaired electron. You could ask a question about that. I could say, how many unpaired electrons does such and such have? You would have to draw an orbital diagram and see for yourself that there's only one that is unpaired. All right, so that's chlorine. Let's now get into kind of moving farther down our periodic table into something that would be a little bit more challenging. How about something like, um, let's do, how about one of our transition metals? How about we could do something like, um, let's do manganese. Actually, you know what, let's do iron. Let's do iron. Let's get an electron configuration for iron. Iron's atomic number is 26 meaning we have 26 electrons to place into orbitals. All right, we are just going to place them in the correct order of the orbitals as they, you know, according to the off principle, this one is the lowest energy, then this one, then this one, then this one. And so we'll just follow this order. So the 1s is certainly going to be full. We've got 26 electrons, so that orbital is going to have been filled up, as will the 2s, as will the 2p sublevel. Okay, because we're nowhere near 26. Just filling them up in order. Then the 3s, full. Then the 3p gets filled up, okay? He's going to have six. Because that's how many that sublevel can hold. Now, notice, after the 3p, a lot of times students will just do 3d, but they're not, if you do that, you're not comprehending what I'm saying about the, 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 the energy ordering. No matter whether you think about it from the point of view of the diagonal rule, which shows you that after you fill up 3P, you should be filling up 4S before you start filling up 3D. Or you notice this, after the 3P, if you try to look at the next highest energy orbital, you'll notice the 4S is lower before you hit the 3D. So whatever way you want to look at it, you should see that after you fill up the 3P, it's the 4s that gets filled up next, and he will be full, okay, because we've got 26 electrons, and we're now at, that's 10, now that's 20, so we have six more. Where will they go? After the 4s, we are going to hit the 3d orbitals. Now, technically, the 3d can hold 10, but we don't have 10 left. We only have six, and that is going to be the electron configuration for iron. Let me go ahead and show you what the orbital diagram looks like. This one's different because now I have d orbitals, so I just want to make sure I do one of kind of every type. So S's are just single boxes because it's just a single orbital, whereas the P's are always a set of three because it's three different orbitals in three different orientations. Three S then the 3p, all of these are full with 26 electrons. Now, 4s comes next. So you'll notice sometimes it's easier to do your electron configuration first before you do an orbital diagram. Now, the 3d6, or sorry, the 3ds. Remember, d orbitals come as a set of five, five different orbitals in five different orientations. So you will be drawing a box like a rectangle, but five different orbitals in it. And you'll label the whole thing. See, in the electron configuration, that represents the whole 3D sublevel, not just a single orbital. Um, in the orbital diagram, you, you, you like show all the different orbitals, okay? Now, the six electrons, make sure you follow Hun's rule. Hun's rule says within an orbital sublevel, kind of any of these rectangles is sublevel. That's a sublevel. That's the 3p sublevel. This is the 3d sublevel. You fill up singly before doubling up. One, two, three, four, five, six. That is the orbital diagram for iron.
How many unpaired electrons does it have? You would say four. So with that type of question, I'm testing lots of different things. Can you write an electron configuration? Are you doing Hunt's rule correctly with your orbital diagrams and that type of thing? Um, another type of question that you could ask, um, you know, could you say what are the four quantum numbers um, for the electron in this box? Okay, so the, what are the four quantum numbers for the electron in this box? Um, that's another kind of alternate question that could be asked. Let's go ahead and address something like that real quick. The four quantum numbers for the electrons in this very last box. Well, the n would be equal to four. I'm oh, sorry, the n would be equal to three. That's the n value. The l, these are d orbitals, so the l value is going to equal is is going to be equal to um, two. Okay, if you look back at the previous slide, d orbitals have an l value equal to two. The ml value, remember the ml values can be all the numbers from negative l to positive l. So it's like this one would be negative two, negative one, zero, positive one, positive two. You would just go in order of the number line. So the ml value would be positive two, and the ms value spinning up would be positive one half. So you could ask for like, I could ask, what are the quantum numbers for any one electron? Um, you know, same thing um, for any of them, I really could ask. Okay, so that's just another type of, type of question that you could encounter. Um, all right, so we have done um, a bunch of different uh, elements. And now, really, the last thing I want to talk about is... Ions, electron configurations for ions. So far, we've only been talking about electron configurations for atoms, like neutral atoms. But now let's transition to just a little side topic here. Electron configurations for ions. Ions obviously being like charged atoms. All right, so for, let's go ahead and say for main group ions, okay, main group being um, on your periodic table, last from the past here, the main group is the first two columns and the last six columns, um, whereas the middle ones are called transition elements. Those are also transition elements, by the way, but the, the middle ones are transition. The main group are the first two columns and the last six columns. For main group ions, it's very easy to write electron configurations just um, for ions. Just add or remove electrons from the end. This is really what your common sense would tell you. So let me go ahead and show you what I mean by that. Um, let me go ahead and do two different ions here. How about something like um, cesium-1 plus, that's a cation, and let me go ahead and just do um, phosphorus-3 minus, that's an anion, all right, and um, notice I've picked main group elements, all right, what I would do if you have an ion is I always just do the regular atom first, so I'm just I'm just doing electron configurations here, by the way. I don't want to do um, orbital diagrams um, just for the sake of time. But anyhow, electron configurations, just do plain cesium first. So cesium has 55 electrons, okay? So this is pretty tedious, but I chose a big one, so that's okay. Um, we are going to fill up, let me see, actually, this is in levels. You know what? Let me not do cesium because I don't even have sixes up there. Let me do rubidium. Save me a little bit of time. By the way, on the exam, I will tend to choose elements that are fewer in 
um, electrons kind of towards the top of the periodic table rather than ones that are down low. As you can imagine, the ones down low have a ton of electrons and it takes forever to write the electron configurations. So I will lean towards higher up. So that's why I'm kind of moving up a little higher for the sake of myself here. Rubidium is 37 electrons. So let's go ahead and start doing his electron configuration. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, so we're just filling all these up. We gotta go 30, so it's 37 electrons for plain rubidium, for neutral rubidium. 3s2, so let's see here, 3p6, 4s2, we're nowhere near 37 yet. 3d10, let me take a look at the stop and see how many we've placed. That's 10, that's 10 more, so that's 20. Now I've placed 30. Okay, so now we're getting closer here. So 3D10 is full. The next one to get filled up will be 4P. And he will be full because I've got 37 to place. So the 4P will end up having six. And the 5S, which is the next one, will end up only having one for neutral rubidium. For neutral rubidium. That gets me my 37 electrons. And all that I did was follow those green arrows, filling up and like only moving on to the next level after I filled up the level before. Now, rubidium plus is a cation. When you see a plus, as you all know by now, that means you have lost one electron, okay? If you saw two plus, you would have lost two electrons. Remember, the only way to become a cation is to lose some of your negativities, lose a few of those electrons. In this case, it's only lost one electron. That's why it's only a plus one charge. Which electron does it lose? Well, just isn't, once again, common sense. You think it's going to lose the one that's close to the nucleus that's held really, really tight and really buried in that atom? Or is it going to lose the one on the outside? And you would be correct. It's going to lose the one on the outside. So that's the one that will be gone. Now, um, you can either cross it out or just erase it. But that is the electron configuration for RB plus for the rubidium cation. Um, let me see, I maybe will make this point right now. Well, um, uh, let me make this point right now here. You'll notice, let me write the word note. You will note that when rubidium loses that electron to become rubidium plus, this ends up, let me write the word, gives gives him the same electron configuration as what's called the nearest noble gas. Okay. Rubidium on your periodic table is right there. His closest noble gas, there's two noble gases kind of near him, okay? So um, one is to go all the way forward and hit xenon. But if you just move one backward, you'll hit krypton. That krypton is what's called his nearest noble gas, okay? And when he loses that electron, if you had drawn krypton's electron configuration, you would end up getting the exact same one. So the key here is that the, the whole point of noble gases, the reason they're called noble, is because they're very satisfied with their electron configuration. Their electron configuration is, is what's considered full. They have all of their um, electron sublevels are full. Notice they're all full. And um, that's a very happy or stable situation for the atom to have all of their sublevels full. Now, that's why noble gases don't really undergo elect, um, where am I? Don't really undergo chemical reactions because they don't have to. They have this super full, um, perfect electron configuration as is. They don't need to give or take away or anything like that. Um, it also explains why, when we learned that this column always forms one plus cations, the reason they form one plus cations is because when they do, they get that very stable electron configuration of having them all full that the noble gas has had. It's called sometimes called noble gas envy. So this explains, it wasn't just like 
a like chancy thing that these all become one plus cations. They all become one plus cations so that they can have this very enviable electron configuration of having all of your sublevels filled. So it kind of explains a lot of chemistry, even from the point of view of this electron configuration. Let's go over to this anion, P3 minus, phosphorus 3 minus. Let's do regular phosphorus first. The neutral phosphorus has 15 electrons. Let's go ahead and place them. So it's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p3. That's your 15 electrons for regular phosphorus. However, when phosphorus becomes a 3 minus anion, that means he really gained three electrons. So in this time, rather than taking away electrons, you're just going to add electrons. But you're going to add them, once again, to the end of the electron configuration. So those extra three electrons will go to the very end of your electron configuration. So instead of being 3p3, it has it's 3p6. Notice p3 minus should have had 18 electrons because you have the 15 from the neutral plus the three extras, 18. And you'll notice that now all of our numbers do add up to 18. Once again, I just want you to notice the reason that phosphorus became the three minus um, anion is for the very same reason as the rubidium situation. When he gains those three electrons, he's now full. All of his sublevels are full. And he gets this very enviable, very um, low energy, very stable electron con configuration of his nearest noble gas. Phosphorus's nearest noble gas is argon. And if you were to draw argons, you would have actually drawn this exact same thing. So once again, noble gas envy is really the, let me write that down. Noble gas envy really explains why elements form the ions that they do. Explains why rubidium forms a, a plus one and not a plus two. Plus two wouldn't have helped him, plus one does. Um, last thing we need to talk about here is ions for transition elements. So these were all um, these were all main group elements. But let's talk about the transition elements because there's a different situation for the transition elements. For the transition elements, what happens if you have an ion of one of those? So once again, all the transition elements, these ones in this area, in the whoops, in the middle and also the lower ones, they're all metals. If you look at them, they're all to the left of that zigzag line anyways. So sometimes these are called transition metals. Okay, um, we know that transition elements, transition metals, they're only gonna form cations. Metals don't form anions. Metals form cations. So we're only talking about losing electrons. We're not talking about gaining them. They, they don't do that. So for, but for transition metals, here's the key here. You always remove the outer S electrons first before taking from the Ds. Now, this is, a, um, it, this is not common sense, so this is why you have to be kind of told that this is this happens because um, it's not it's not necessarily what you would expect. But let's use a, an example to explain this. How about we come back to our iron? Iron was a good um, was a good uh, transition metal for us. Iron forms multiple different um, cations, but one of them is called the the Fe three plus um, or the iron three cation. Uh, let's go ahead and draw his electron configuration. So for, for this particular cation, the iron three plus cation. Once again, I always just do plain iron first. So plain iron first, iron has that 26 electrons and we did it earlier. So I'll just kind of re-put it back on the board.
Okay, that's regular iron. Now, iron 3 plus has lost three electrons. That's what the significance of that new charge is. The three that it loses, here's the rule. You always want to remove the outer S ones first before taking from the Ds. If you've not been told this rule, your mind would just say take them off the end and you would end up with 4s2, 3d3, and that would be the wrong answer. That is not the electron configuration for iron 3 plus. Instead, the three electrons that get removed, these two, and by the way, the outer S's, not, not the inside S's. These are all safe, safely within the inside of the atom. The outer S, these two are going to be gone. Those two are the first to go, and then the third one would be one of these. So the electron configuration is, let me just clean it up a little bit, is just what I have written here, 3D5. That's the electron configuration for Fe3+, 3D5. Um, let me do one more. How about, uh, let's go manganese 2+, plus. manganese 2+. Plus. I would just do regular manganese first, which is 25 electrons. Um, and we only need to remove two electrons from manganese 2 plus. So which two are going to be gone? It's oh, you always take the outer S ones first. So this is going to be gone. For us two, these electrons are gone. They have been removed. And all we have is what's here. Now what you'll notice, oh, this is a good thing. I can teach this now. What you'll notice is that Fe3 plus and Mn2 plus are what we call isoelectronic. Isoelectronic means having the same electron configuration. They have the same electron configuration. They do. Um, if you look at it, their electrons are in the exact same type of orbitals. Does that make them the same chemical species? No, absolutely not, because this one has a totally different nucleus than this one. And the nucleus matters a lot. So don't get fooled into thinking isoelectronic makes them the, like the exact same thing. Their electron cloud is the same. But iron 3 plus has 26 protons. Manganese has 25. And it makes a big difference. And um, different numbers of neutrons as well. So they're not the same species. Um, isoelectronic, we could have also said, I kind of hinted at it before, but like rubidium 1 plus was isoelectronic electronic with krypton. Um, the P3 minus was isoelectronic with argon. So this, this term isoelectronic, that could show up on your exam just in terms of can you use it um, correctly. So we've done electron configurations for ions. That's a good place for this video to stop. In the next video, we're going to talk about um, core and valence electrons. I'm going to actually go over the, the orbital blocks on the periodic table. So if you know anything about that, that's coming in the next video. And then once I do that, I can kind of teach you how to just read the periodic table to do your electron configurations as well. However, some people very much like that method, and that's totally fine. If you don't like the method that I teach you in the next video, just come back to this. It works just as well. Um, so it's like a, a personal choice type of thing. And then we're also going to learn the periodic properties. So all of that will come in the following video. But this is a good place um, for this one to stop. So hopefully that was helpful. If you already knew how to do a lot of it, super. That's great. Just make sure that you don't miss the stuff that you maybe didn't know about the principles or um, this stuff or isoelectronic, whatever. All of this stuff can show up on the exam. So um, take whatever you need from it. But hopefully it helped. And have a good rest of your day.